Welcome to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. We interview great guests who inspire you to overcome obstacles and achieve your goals. Be sure you visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, just relax as you listen. You can do something else, but be ready to make an important note. And let's get started. The title of this interview is Creating, Co-Creating, and Manifesting a Peaceful, Powerful, Prosperous Planet. Together and forever. Are you in? Now, we're going to be talking about some great stuff. Things like changing your words, change your world, learn how to create inner peace, personal empowerment. And by the way, the way Janet, who I gave her name out a little prematurely, has written that is segmented in three way, three parts, empowerment, I love that, and prosperity, abundance, in your own life. Show your friends and your family how to do it. Like a single drop in a still pond rippling out, together we can create, co-create, and manifest a peaceful, powerful, prosperous planet together and forever. Now, before I even say her bio, which is great, I'm gonna, I just want to address this title because it's really so compelling. It's so beautiful. Words are so important. I, I, we can have the bio. Listen, we, we, we don't have, we're not beholden to any strict format. We can have the bio in a bit. It doesn't have to be at the very beginning because this is really such great stuff. I, it's so powerful, your, your intention, your plan, and what you're doing. I've already been to her website. It's so awesome that I said, Janet, I'm in. We'll talk more about that later. But what she just described as the things that she's about, you know, change your words, change your world. I found this so true many years ago that I had to change my words and then the world changed subsequently. I found that I learned from, I think, re re reading Neil Donald Walsh's Conversations with God in the 90s, which was very powerful. The three levels of, of, of creation, of energy, right? Thought, right? words and then action and i found that to be so true when i change my words not just externally but just as importantly internally there was there, there started being a different world for me right and and that include that it's very important including in calling people pejoratives especially like fuck her fuck them you know when i stopped i stopped doing that i reduced that because i found that there was really there was anger behind that there was differentiation and division and maybe superiority. That didn't, that didn't work for me anymore. And when I stopped that, I had a different experience. I continue to have a different experience. Life is much more pleasant. The world is much more pleasant because of the things that I decided to change about the way I thought. So, and that is, so what she's talking about here is absolutely true. And she's going to definitely testify to that. We'll see. But let me tell you about her. And you could have chimed right in there. Janet, if you like, or you can just wait for your bio. Tony, you're not giving me a chance to chime <laughs> in because you're <laughs> zooming along yourself. But I mean, what you're saying is great. I can only sit here and nod my head. <laughs> okay, great. So I'll, I'm going. I'm going to tell you uh, Janet's bio. Now, Dr. Janet Smith Warfield serves wisdom seekers who want understanding and clarity, so they can live peaceful powerful, prosperous lives. Through her unique combination of holistic, creative, right brain transformational experiences and 22 years of rigorous left brain law practice, how's that combination? She has learned how to sculpt words, wonderful, it's all about balance. She has learned how to sculpt words in, a, in atypical ways, shifting her listeners into experiences beyond words transforming turmoil into inner peace. Janet is the founder of Planetary Peace, Power, and Prosperity Legacy Foundation, Incorporated, a semantic solution to all the human-created suffering on our planet. I love it. So with that, ladies and gentlemen and others, Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield. Well, Tony, thank you for that magnificent introduction of I don't even know what to say. What do you want to know? <laughs> but, you know, the first thing I want to say is, you know, this is, I said this to my 
the last interview I did, with, who was with uh, with Josh uh, Zeppis just yesterday, and I said to him, you know, I, I called him a special guest because I felt that he was special, but I had called the preceding one that. I'm like, am I devaluing the word special? I realized that, no, no, I'm not, because you are very special, so obvious to me. So what, what is this word special? Is that, well, something different about someone, right? I find that you're special because right off the bat, I, I, inter I usually interview business people, change workers, uh, you know, people, uh, entrepreneurs, and I'm not saying you're not, not any of that, but what you're bringing is this wonderful metaphysical, globally focused, you know, intention and plan that is just, I, I haven't come across it in my, in, this is the uh, first in my podcast. Isn't it? I haven't had anyone like you on my podcast yet. <laughs> I'm totally sincerely, check it out, check them out, check out my list. And I, so you're special in that way. And I re I've been to your website. I love what you're about. Tony, we are all special, unique human beings. But the challenge is to discover that uniqueness within each, each one of us, because each one of us has a very special gift to bring to this planet. So how do we discover that and uncover it when we've been subjected to so many abusive words, perhaps? as we've been growing up by um, other people who are also not feeling good enough. And so the only way they can feel good about themselves is to slam somebody else down mm. or fight against somebody else and win. Right. But that's not. Absolutely. It works. It, it's, it's not a power over dynamic or a power against dynamic, which most of us are stuck in. It's a power with dynamic and it's a power with, there are no words for it. Um, I, will, I will use a word like source or energy or a power greater than myself, but it's reconnecting with a living, breathing energy that you can allow flow through you and you learn to trust and if you stay in that own your own connection sometimes not always you can attract other people there too and then you are in this magnificent creative co-creative manifesting space where everyone is respectful everyone is grateful everyone is giving and receiving Think of the infinity symbol. Um, let, let me address. It's very, very hard to talk about. And let me just add one other thing here. Mm. You, if you start looking at the, the words in religions about words, uh, the eternal Tao cannot be spoken. And uh, it can be pointed to. And this is what Buddhists will say, words are fingers pointing at the moon. They are not the moon. So they can be useful and helpful, but we need to master our words and master all our own internal energies as well. For example, if we're stuck in fear or terror, or we're stuck in rage, or we're stuck in shame and not feeling good enough, if we change our words, we change the energy within us and we can, I'm, I'm challenged here with the words. I, 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 I love, I definitely, because what you're saying, oh, words are extremely useful to say the least, that, but they're also, they're also not who we really are. That's just what we use to communicate to both ourselves as well as others. They're tools, they're, they're vehicles. They're tools, just like the Buddha said. But they're, they're not truths. Yes, yes, they're representations, all right, of ideas. It's a wonderful they're, they're, thing. Well, well, words emerge out of our personal experiences, and mm. human beings created words, including all the words in all the religious doctrines. Yes. So we've created these 
And the, the question really is, how are we going to use them? Are we going to use them to abuse one another and desecrate our own energies and our own souls? Or are we going to use our words to support one another and respect one another and be so grateful for the gifts that are offered by other unique human beings on this planet? I am. I'm 85 years old. Ah. I am I am still learning and growing. <laughs> well, good for you. I had no idea you were 85. Wow, you do not look it at all. You've got a wonderful uh, energy, a vivacious energy about you, uh, both in your face and, you know, your countenance. And I love what you, I, I mean, this, and so it's no surprise that you look much longer than, uh, you, that you look much younger than you are because I, it's fantastic. Now, let me let me back up let me, uh, some of the stuff you said because I'd like to reply to it. First of all, many years ago, I realized that I was blessed. I'm a recovered drug addict. I've been clean and sober 20 years. And, and in the early part of that recovery, I realized that the whole time I had been blessed, but I didn't realize it to that moment. But then I also realized that everyone else is too. They just, many of them just don't realize it. And I just had a moment of clarity and understanding and I realized it. So it's really the, the challenge for everyone is to realize that they're all blessed, every one of us. And, you know, talking about fighting, it's only the ego that wants to attack or wants to defend as well. There's no need for either. It's all, a, it's all an illusion. It's all a construction of, a, of our part. It's completely unnecessary and regressive, right? You know, so it's, it's, there's no need for it. And, and if you find yourself attacking and defending, you can say to yourself, wait, this is just my ego. This is not who I really am. And I don't need to do this. And why? Because it's all, a, we're, it's one homogeny. We're all, it's all part of a oneness. We're all part of the same thing, having an individual experience. So we don't need to get caught up in the differences. You know, we uh, different. Yeah, I go on. You were going to say something. Well, I was going to say, I, I think it's at least for me in dealing with relationships, it's important to understand the differences because each of us on this physical plane is unique. Beautifully. So that um, I know I'm always really curious if there's a dissonance or it feels as if there's a dissonance between me and another person. Incidentally, let me just go off on a tangent here. Please. Look at the logo behind me. Yes, I love it. That, that center circle, which is too large because it's really a, it's a present moment point of pure awareness or beingness. And our challenge is to reconnect back into that. And then all those brilliant lines going out from that center point are all the unique individuals on this planet, each with a unique gift to give. And the challenge is how do we connect all those gifts? Yes. Uh, because it's really- That is the challenge. It's, it's easy to turn them into truths or doctrines instead right. of tools or vehicles. Absolutely. You're not gonna find the bigger proponent for individuality than me. However, the first thing I, I will say, and I always will say, it must be balanced with being a team, a team player, but the collective. So never compromise who you are, but don't be a selfish prick either. <laughs> right? <laughs> balance it. It's balance. You know, it's it's interesting that you're a recovered drug addict, right? Because I'm, um, I was in Naranon for twelve years, which is the flip side of the drug addiction. Ah. That's that's the people addiction. Right. The person who will knock themselves out to support another person, including a drug addict. Right, right. Rather than setting back, learning to set boundaries and take care of themselves, right. which is the primary job for each and every one of us on this planet. If each and every one of us were to bring inner peace, personal empowerment, and personal prosperity, which is not necessarily money. It can be, I mean, money flow can be part of it, but walking on a beach at sunset, that's abundance. Oh my gosh. Oh. Snorkeling on a reef in Roatan, oh. Honduras, off Roatan, Honduras, where you, you become part of that reef and all the gorgeous coral and the fish swimming around. 
you're not even thinking, you're just experiencing the beauty of it. That to me is abundance. Now, of course, I use planetary peace, power, and prosperity because I like the alliteration of it. It's beautiful. But those words also have meaning. And if each and every one of us would bring inner peace, personal empowerment, and prosperity or abundance into our own lives, it would become planetary. And then it would be this, this creation, co-creation, and constant amazing manifestation within a, um, a global community of mutual respect and gratitude and appreciation. And let me just mention, because to me, I, when I think, when this kind of popped into my mind, I thought this was really interesting because that power with, and it's power, it's power with that living, breathing energy, whatever name you want to give it, God, Allah, universal energy, the Tao. Um, they're, they're, right. The label doesn't matter. Well, the, the label is a placeholder for something that you can't really talk about. Hmm. So it, it's, it's a word that you stick on an experience that you really can't explain to somebody who hasn't had the experience. But let me finish this point, which is this power with dynamic. It's power with a living, breathing energy. Let's call it that for now. It's power within yourself. And it's power with another person, with other human beings. If you stop that for a minute, this is also the Christian symbol for praying. Yes. And the Buddhist symbol for namaste. I make now, it often. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> it is a really strange coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> okay, this has been awesome, and we're going to continue. So let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor, and we'll be right back with Dr. Janet Smith. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. People start something, then something comes up, or they need a break or even a vacation, and they often never get back on track. Perficio is designed to allow all of this. Visit www.perficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where you can live your life as you learn and make progress toward your life-changing goals. You are listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. We're here with Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield, and we're having a lovely organic conversation. But now I'm going to start getting into some questions. Janet, you had a mystical experience 55 years ago. What was it like? I actually had three consciousness-shifting experiences during a pretty close period of time, maybe a month or two apart. The first one, I was challenged. I had three preschool sons at the time. And when my youngest son was born, my oldest son began wetting the bed. He'd been toilet trained for a while and all of a sudden he starts wetting the bed. It's the last thing I needed because <laughs> Believe me, with three preschoolers, right. I was busy. I had a husband to care for, a house to care for, a garden to care for, a yard to care for, and three preschoolers to entertain or make sure, at least make sure they were safe. So I didn't need a wet bed every morning. And of course, you know, I, being the perfect mother and wife, I immediately thought, He's wet the bed. I've got to strip the sheets. I've got to wash them. I've got right. to wash his pajamas. This is a lot of extra work for me that I really don't need. So at first, I just, I thought, well, you know, I'll just ignore this. Maybe it'll go away on its own. Well, it didn't. Almost, almost every morning, the bed's still wet. So I figured it was time to sit down and have a talk with Bill and explain to him why a five-year-old is too old to wet the bed. Well, we sat down and he looked at me very attentively and he listened. But the next morning, the bed was still wet. 
and I was getting more frustrated. I raised my voice. That didn't work. The bed was still wet. And I think I even spanked him once, and then I knew I was getting out of control. And it was not a space I wanted to be in. And around that time, my mother gave me a book. You talk about words being uh, fingers pointing at the moon. This was a book by a, an English schoolmaster, A.S. Neal. It was called Summerhill. A.S. Neal ran a boarding school in England. And he had a really strange way of dealing with the, um, I'm going to call them problem children, but the, the now let me dump that word. Uh, the children who would come to class and would throw spitballs or punch other kids in the class or be disruptive in some way so that Neil could not teach what, or that the other teachers couldn't teach what they were there to teach. So there, there was this, this tension going on or this. Neil did not pull those kids aside, stick them in a corner, and make them stay there until they decided they could be good. He didn't make them sit down and write a hundred times, I will behave. He gave them a penny. <laughs> I thought he did what? <laughs> you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why? Why would you reward a child for bad behavior? Which is the way I was framing it at the time. Right, right. But I was also pretty desperate, and it was something I hadn't tried. So I mean, okay, I don't understand this. It's not making any sense to me, but I'll give it a try. Next morning, the bed was wet. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, I have a model to follow, though. I have words, fingers pointing at the moon. I went to my wallet. I pulled out a penny. I gave it to Bill. He kind of looked up at me as if, what was wrong with her this morning? This is not normal mother behavior. I walked away. What happened? He never wet the bed. I love it. And I, I was, I was amazed. I it was so easy. And wow. I couldn't stop thinking about it. You know, it was just. Uh, I'm trying to remember who said I may have been um, A.R. Uh, Ammons. I'm not sure. But somebody once said, again, these are words, fingers pointing at the moon. It's not what you, and now I can't remember the quote. So what, 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 do, what do you, how do you attribute the change that he had? How do you attribute? Well, it? from hindsight, I think, I probably wasn't giving him as much time and attention as I previously had. He was feeling maybe mommy doesn't love me anymore. We, I've got this new brother now who's demanding a lot of her attention. Where is she? You know, I want her around. Well, and it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And then when you gave him a reward instead of a punishment, he was, he was, he knew he was still loved. Um, but I didn't, put all that together for literally years. I mean, it was just, oh my gosh, this is so simple. Uh, there are two more experiences after that. So if, can we follow this thread? No, no I, I, wanna, I wanna stop moving, stop speeding along. So that was an excellent story. Uh, now, but I, just to finish up this, this part, uh, why, why did it take so long? Like you said you had two other experiences subsequently. Why did it take so long for you to start talking about this, you know, the, these experiences, you, the mystical stuff and changes in your life. What did, what did... Oh, I, I did start talking about it. And I was met with these blank stares. Oh, okay. No, I, so I was talking, but no one of... was hearing what I was saying because they had not experienced something similar. Right. So it was, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, let's stay away from her. She's nuts. <laughs> right, right. Giving out pennies. So, but, it, but what it did for me, then it caused me to pull back and start looking at the words I was using as I was speaking about this experience to other people. And I spent literally, because I was driven, I was driven to communicate mm. what I had 
learned as a result of just changing my own conduct. So um, I kept looking at the words, you know, what's wrong with the words I'm using? I tried stories, I tried poetry, didactic teaching, I really didn't like because it kind of threw me into self-righteousness. This is the, what the rules are, this is the way you have to do it. Um, metaphor, allegory, I played with all of these. And some of them worked some of the time, but it was, I realized after a while that the vehicle of words was the wrong tool or, or some, it could be. It, it, it can be a tool, but it depends on how it's heard. And you, it, timing is so important too. So anyway, um, I, I got so frustrated with the words, I started using images. So I was drawing instead. And sometimes that would kind of pull the, what felt like um, opposites together. But just look at words, look at what they do. Yes. Words separate, divide and categorize. Mm -hmm. And when, t when we take them seriously, then instead of fingers pointing at the moon, then we become separated, divided and categorized. Right. And what category are we either sticking ourselves in we're sticking somebody else in, or is somebody sticking us in? And where is the truth in all this? What Absolutely. do we choose? What do we choose? That word is really important to believe. And what energy do we want to put ourselves into? I, I'm not getting this out too well. I, I absolutely agree. I, I mean, I, totally. I mean, there's nothing to dispute there at all. And I think that, you know, words are extremely not just useful but necessary for us humans but we must not be limited by them or or be use them detrimentally for ourselves and for others categories are great up until they're detrimental <laughs> right and we and that's often we find people categorizing detrimentally today and dividing 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 instead of unifying instead of having homogeneity there's always a division so you know that's we have to start getting away from that or at least start thinking more beneficially and powerfully of how we can come together instead of how we can separate but let me go on to my, let me go to my next question before our, our next break and that is if words are such a challenge what makes you think you can use them effectively now <laughs> you you want that answer now yeah. i'm not sure i can but sometimes i can i know there are times i, I there are times by using words well uh, questions are another really great vehicle by using words well, sometimes I can open up somebody's mind or give them another way of thinking about a challenge that they're having. And the way I know that is that I've gotten lots of feedback over the years from people who have had that experience. With my first book, Shift, Change Your Words, Change Your World, I've had people uh, tell me they read it and they got something out of it. And then they went back three months later and read it again. They got something totally different out of it the second time because they were in a different place at that point in time. So not just so something it, more, but totally different the second time around. Yeah, and, and maybe they needed something different or maybe they went deeper into something that they'd read before. Uh, I've had other people who use it like a, a, a deck of tarot, tarot cards where they just open it to a page in the morning and they find exactly what they need, when they, which to me is, is, that's interesting. I wasn't trying to do that. <laughs> uh, our, our states and our, this, and our circumstances internally and externally are very important about what information is going on in our conscious mind, right? That we're aware of, isn't it? Yeah, and that's all about mindfulness. It's about watching your own mind, which is, <clears throat> again, a, um, a Buddhist teaching, uh, the witness. You watch your own mind, mm. and you'll find it may be flying all over the place. So where do you want to land your mind? And ultimately, the place where you land it is right here, right now, in this present moment I can, I, was, remember, I can remember the first time i really saw a raindrop 
fall into a puddle of water because I was out of my head and into the experience. That's fantastic. I was meditating this morning, not a single moment of silence, but however, I'm here right now with you. And I, let me tell you, sister, I'm present. This is great, great stuff. I <laughs> love what's going on here. Uh, and you know, hey, it's all good. <laughs> so let's, let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll be right back with Dr. Janet smith Warfield. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. What is the key to wealth? It's not just making money, it's not wasting it, avoiding debt and costly mistakes. To get the wealth mindset, visit www.perficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where you can start acting like a millionaire instead of just dreaming to be one. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield. And my next question to her, because I've got to ask her questions because we, her and I can go on and on. This is just a wonderful dialogue between us. There's so much wonderful things to share. So here's my next question for her. And this is, and it's this. Assuming you now know how to use words effectively to catalyze this experience in others, what can you teach? What can you bring into people's lives? And that's about the challenge. We're talking about the challenge. That's, that's, this is a continuation from the previous one. Well, sometimes I can, and sometimes I can't. If someone is totally shut down and closed to learning anything new, they think they already know everything. Hmm. They're in self-righteousness and judgment. There's probably nothing I can do. Um, although, it's interesting. Sometimes if I will play their game, instead of having a conversation between unique individuals, I just step into their, whatever their structure is, yeah. if they think is right, and if they think everything else is wrong, sometimes it shifts the dynamic between us. Yeah, I love that method. <laughs> because it, it puts the power back into their hands. Okay. I'll play according to your rules as long as it doesn't put me out of integrity because I won't step out of integrity. I'm really clear on that. That's where it's at. You know, there's nothing like looking at, you know, looking at yourself in the mirror and liking what you like is just what you say is, is necessary. If you can't, if you're not having that, it's much, it's very difficult to do so much of what we're talking about. And I, I tell you, that was a, a critical thing. I, as a young recovering addict, I had, that was the biggest hurdle I had to, I had to get over was feeling uh, uh, that I, I had, that I had, I deserved good things and that I was likable and that I was worthy of love and to like myself. And uh, cause I was in denial about it too. Not just that I, that I have it. I was in denial about, it. Oh yeah, I like myself. And I'll, let me self-destruct some more. <laughs> so, you know, that was an imperative thing. But uh, it's, you know, when you, everything is, is a process. Like, there's hardly an event, <laughs> right? Even an event is just a point in a process more often than, than not. Uh, and sometimes we can, we lose patience, right? But what's the solution to losing, being impatient, but just patience, <laughs> right? Well, it's, uh, sometimes it is. It's interesting that for me, um, and I know one of the things we haven't really talked about yet is anger or rage. I was, that's my next question. So, oh, all right, good. Well, then I anticipated what you were going to talk about. What an interesting synchronicity. Excellent. So, um, there is an anger which can be transformed into a passion. So, instead of fighting against injustice, you learn to take, you are a passion for justice. I don't know whether you can feel a shift, an energetic shift as I talk about fighting against injustice or standing for justice. And for me, there's a huge shift in focus. And it, it means that you have to be very strong because you may have somebody out there bashing you for whatever reason they want to bash you because they're not feeling good enough. But you are standing 
strong in your own strength and power and connection with that living, breathe, breathing energy flowing through you. And people can kill your body, but they can't kill your soul when you are in that strength. And so it's anger is a real, or rage is a strong, strong emotion. But unfortunately, a lot of the time it's directed against somebody else. He's to blame. He, made, he did the wrong thing. He made me hurt. He was wrong, and that sticks you right into self-righteousness. But if you, if, if you can still stand in a position where you don't want to see certain conduct continue, it's all about, this is what the Buddhists would call right action. So you don't want to put yourself into that fighting against position, but you can stand firmly for respect and gratitude and support, mutual support and teamwork. I'm studying uh, the meditations right now by Marcus Aurelius. I'm really into stoicism right now. And one of the things that Aurelius says is, is that sins of anger are not nearly as bad as sins of pleasure. So, uh, and, I, <laughs> and, I, and I really love this, you know, because sometimes, you know, we can, well, obviously we justify every, anything and everything we do. No, no, no one can justify or rationalize anything like a human being. <laughs> we'll, we'll do anything. The absolute worst thing imaginable. It, it can be justified and rationalized. So, uh, but, so, you know, we can rationalize anger, uh, but it's just a rationalization. But if we're, if we're, if it's pleasure, if it's something that's already seated that, you know, something we're prideful about, we don't want to change that's worse. Uh, so if you're angry, you can, you can, you can already start forgiving yourself or the other person, uh, because it's not nearly as bad as if you had, if you had a pleasure. But, but, but forgiveness does not mean that you continue to tolerate no. um, conduct that is harmful. Let me put it that way. Both to the other person and to yourself. You don't. Absolutely. And, and it's, so, it's so interesting. I had an experience once when I was practicing law with a wonderful chancery judge in Atlantic County. New Jersey, his name was Anthony Gibson. And I had I was working at the time for a large law firm in Atlantic City. I was oh, being Atlantic City? Atlantic City, New Jersey. Right. Um, and I I was working like 80 hours a week. I was knocking myself out. I was not getting paid a lot of money to do this. And the partner for whom I was working would send me off on one exploration to do for him, which I would do. And then he'd change his mind and, well, no, let's, let's look at this instead. And I go off and I was exhausted. And I was becoming very angry over this dynamic between this partner and me. Well, I was focusing my rage, I, I was looking for a sympathetic listener. I started talking about my frustrations to this judge. He just walked away from me. <laughs> Boy, did I ever learn a lesson because that's a good way to deal with someone who is, I was abusing him. Yes. And I was directing my anger, or my rage in the wrong direction. Ultimately, I used my frustration and rage to leave that law firm and take a job at lower pay at a company that at the time treated me decently and didn't work me to death. What was the lesson that you learned when that judge walked away from you specifically? Not to vent my anger and rage toward someone or sympathy. who or who couldn't do anything uh -oh. about it. So it wasn't about sympathy, eliciting, uh, soliciting, eliciting sympathy, but it was about not being dysfunctional. <laughs> what was the? Um... Well, well, the point was I had to take my own power back. It was I who had to do something about that dysfunctional dynamic. 
That's and then I did it the same way the judge did with me. Yes, I, I walked out of the law firm and said, go find somebody else to play your game. I don't want to plot that one anymore. I love it. I contend that whenever we want sympathy from someone, it's always it comes from what I call the false ego, not who we think we are, which is our e identity, our ego, right? But not even that. It's, so, it's a non-identity where we just want sympathy so you, you'll do for us. <laughs> so if you have sympathy for me, then you'll do for me. Or, well, or the other side of that is, oh, aren't I great? Aren't I great? How great are, am I? Can you please sing my praises to others? You know, this, so it's not, I, not to do with my identity of who I think I am, Tony Petroza, all right, or Janet Smith, just that I'm great. Sing my praises. So these are, are, are full, you know, there's the, I, first of all, I've already contended that the ego is a construct. But beyond that, or, or this false ego, you know, soliciting sympathy or soliciting praise is not even part of that because it's not who we are. Well, sometimes it's just wanting someone to hear. It's wanting to speak your own frustration or your own pain out to another person who will listen. And if the other person has the time and the willingness to listen, it actually can help to have that dynamic going on. But each person has to decide, is this something I want to listen to or is it wasting my Absolutely. time? Absolutely. I mean, who could argue with that? But I differentiate between that, which I call empathy and sympathy. That's a differentiation I make. You know, empathy is a wonderful and necessary thing that we must have for others. Not all the time, but, you know, at least as, you know, we, it should be part of our communication, right? But sympathy is uh, is is uh you know manipulation 101 <laughs> well it's it's a kind of codependency in a way it's not standing in my own strength and power and allowing another person's frustration to control the conversation let's let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll be right back with dr janet smith this episode of self-help coaching is brought to you by perfizio what if there was a self-improvement program truly personalized to you, that knew and cared for you deeply, that whatever was going on in your life adapted for you perpetually? Visit www.perphysio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O.io, where you can start a program that will always suit you considering all the pressures and nuances of your life. You are listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza, and we are with Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield, and we're talking about wonderful things. Uh, now I want to, first of all, let's to continue about, about anger. Janet, what can you do with, with anger? Are you, if you notice you're frequently, ang frequently angry, what can you do with it? Well, I think there's kind of a continuum. It starts with frustration because you're not being listened to or heard. You want to build communication with another person and they're not hearing what you're saying because our words do distort and we understand them differently. Yes. So it's, I, I think it starts with frustration. You're not being heard. You're not being respected. But then it can evolve from frustration into anger and then anger can evolve into rage if it, and and actually there's something that comes i think even before the frustration which is pain right uh, so it's kind of a a continuum of um stronger and stronger and stronger emotion until it starts hitting you it right in the belly in right. the solar plexus and you can feel the, it's like a punch in your belly and you need to do something with it. It's not. And, and, and what there. can be done? Absolutely. You know, I had a terrible sadness about the world when my father left home and, and this sadness became a rage as I got older. And that's exactly, you know, I, I was aware, I became aware of that and then I was able to resolve it. But what, what, do, you, what do you suggest that a person do with, with this anger? Can they resolve it's, it? Do you reckon, it's have challenging, but I think it is a, a standing for right action, 
which means if you see a child being abused by a parent, for example, if there is anything you can do to stop that abuse or to soothe that child, you do it. Now, you, you may be in a circumstance where you can't do that, but you become very aware of that child's pain. Um, the Christian Bible uses the phrase, uh, the sins of the parents are visited on the children. So the parent feels the pain and the frustration and the uh, anger and the rage, and then perhaps leaves home or whatever it is they do. And that impacts the children, as a, in your case. It impacted your life. And then that rage carries on as you become an adult, rage toward your father for leaving. But Maybe he, there was nothing else he could do at the time. Oh, of course. But he, that kind of shifts you into at least a compassion or an understanding. I'm reading, and I, I would like to recommend this book to anybody who is challenged with rage. It's a book by Thich Nhat Han, and it's called Anger. Thich Nhat Han, reading, Anger. Yeah, I, uh, I'm reading it right now. And one of the things he says is the Buddha never told you to eliminate anger from your life. He told you to take care of your anger as you would nurture a little child. So you notice your anger and then you love it and you care for it. But you also, it, it's passion really. It's a very strong passion for right action on this planet and put those words that's kind of an esoteric meaning it doesn't mean that you're always nice to everybody I, I as an, an attorney I learned to get into the face of narcissistic politicians with whom I had to deal and they were lying they were cheating they were manipulating they were abusing. These were men who beat their wives up, put them into the hospital. And they were probably also full of not feeling good enough and perhaps anger and rage. But I got in, into their face with facts. I would really work hard and pull all the information together and then just sit at a council table, for example, and I, I would ask them questions or I would state facts, which were right in the record. They were irrefutable facts. This is what happened. This is what I did. Uh, an example with the city of Atlantic City was, I was hired, of course, I was hired to do mortgage foreclosures, tax sale foreclosures. This is after I had my own private practice. And I was bringing probably 10 times more money into the city than they were paying me in my contract. And also helping to clean up dilapidated neighborhoods. But um, I had to actually go in and defend myself in front of city council. I did it with those kinds of facts because there was one councilman wanted me to put his political sign in my front yard. This is the one who was who probably had beaten his wife up so badly that she got thrown into the hospital. And I said, no. And then he was out to get me. He slandered me. Um, he kept demanding information from me, which I gave him, and it was never good enough. He was the same kind of person who would go running around telling all the people in City Hall to work harder and, and you know, do a better job in, in everything they were doing. And I was not willing to tolerate it. But it also threw me in at that point in time in my life into a lot of fear, which I also had to deal with. So my fear or terror actually also transformed in, into kind of a, it was a rage, but it was also a passion that this, his conduct is wrong conduct. It cannot be allowed to stand. It's not, not about him as a, an individual at all. He's probably a 
been a very abused child probably doesn't feel good enough. It's the only way he can make himself feel important is to bash somebody else down or do this. But right. at, the end of, at the end of that council meeting, every single council person voted to renew my contract, including this council. To renew your contract? Yeah. Okay, great. So it worked out well. But, but well, but I had to go beneath the words, but also use the words as a vehicle to show, hey, I'm doing the job I'm supposed to be doing here, the job I was hired to do. Clear communication. Clear communication, but going beneath all the emotional crap going on to right action. What is, if the city wants to clean up neighborhoods and bring in some, some money as well, this is what needs to be done. Now, of course, that gets into also, this is again, part of Buddhism, right intention. So what is your intention? You know, is that the right intention? Or should your intention be to support people who can't find jobs or don't have maybe the education or the, the family support to be able to even pay mortgages or taxes? It, it, what's the intention here? And this is, this is the hard part, I think, because we're all focused on a different intention. And sometimes if you're bringing in money, you're also displacing people from homes. So how do you resolve this? How do you strike the balance between those two different, probably important intentions? So how do you bring them into alignment yes. where everybody is working together for the benefit of all as much as possible? So do you have an answer or is that the, is that the question that we all have to answer? <laughs> it's, a, it's a question I think each and every one of us right. needs to answer. Great. Now you mentioned, you mentioned the fear. What about the fear? What if you notice you're afraid? <laughs> fear and terror. And, and fear morphs into terror if you keep focusing on it. Um, I watch my mind and I can tell you when I'm feeling fear or terror, my mind is in one of two places. It's either in the future, what if this happens? What if that happens? Or it's on what someone else may think, say, or do. If I say, no, I'm not going to do what you want me to do. That's where the fear or the terror comes from for me. If you are in the middle of a hurricane, you don't have time even to feel fear. You're taking action. You're doing whatever you can to protect yourself. But if you're sitting in your own living room, safe and sound, but your mind's off in the future or focused on what someone else may think, say, or do, you're giving your power away, your personal empowerment away. And once you notice that, then you're in choice. You can leave your mind in the future if you want and continue to feel the fear. What if this happens? What if that happens? You can focus on what somebody else may think, say, or do, and you may want to do that anyway because it's kind of a planning strategy. And that so you can choose your own actions forward. Or you can bring your mind back to the present moment. You are safe in your own living room. You're protected. And then you ask yourself, what is my next step? What can I do right here? right now to move my life in the direction I want it to go. When you do that, you stop giving your power away to a future that may never happen or to another person and you take your power back. It could be as simple a thing as going into your kitchen and cleaning up the mess in your sink. But there is something you can do to bring peace into your own life and order to your own life. So, if that's what you want. Is this the you fast want to continue to feel the fear? Go ahead and keep your, leave your mind right where it is. Excellent. So is this the fast formula to uh, to bring peace it's, and power? It's, it's about mastering your, it's about watching your own mind, which is part of the practice of mindfulness. Hmm. It's a very good practice too. Right. So you bring yourself from the future or, or the, the fear of disapproval. You bring your mind 
the money. You are here now. Right. Bring you it back. Bring it back. Either a task that you can do right now in the present or just concentrate on the awareness of the present moment to get away. That that will reduce or possibly even eliminate the fear. It's it's choosing where you want to focus your mind. Right. Absolutely. And it is a choice. A lot of people don't know that they have choices. Yes, it's a that, it's really mind. important to realize you're always in choice. It's yes or no. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, sometimes when I tell people they do, they're shocked and they can't believe it that they that they can have a choice. They're like, what? What are you crazy? I must. I must do this. No, actually, you can. You don't have to. <laughs> no, and, and I advise people to get that word "should" out of their vocabulary. Absolutely. And and some really helpful questions that have usually gotten me out of this kind of funk are to ask myself right here, right now, because it changes. What do I think? Mm. What do I feel? What do I need? What are my choices? Whom can I trust? And what do I need to know? It's just real simple, right here, right now. And when I can answer those questions, I'm taking my power back. Absolutely. Wonderful. We're going to take a moment to hear uh, from our sponsor, The Final Time, and then we're going to come with the last segment with Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield when we come right back. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. When Ben Franklin arrived in Philadelphia, all he had was 10 cents in his pocket. Despite this, he became America's first self-made man. Visit www.perficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O to actually have the knowledge and principles of Ben Franklin transferred into yourself. You are listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with my special guest, and I mean that. This is really such a, has been such a wonderful interview, and we're not done, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Janet Smith-Warfield. So I have another question now, and this is going to be a very simple one. We've talked about so many great things a person, so many valuable things a person can use and utilize in their lives, but do you have a simple rule for living? Yeah, do whatever you want, as, you, as long as you do no harm, either to yourself or to other living beings. Now, that's a generalization, too. That's a finger pointing at the moon, because every time we eat a meal, we are destroying another life so that our, mm -hmm. we can live, which is probably the origin of the Christian ritual of saying grace before you eat a meal. Thank you for this food that you have provided to my body. Um, I'm thinking, you know, the conversation is never done. It's never done because we are in this constant creation and co-creation. We need to keep it out of the abuse and the violence and keep it in a an energy of continuing to learn and grow and be grateful for the life we've been given. None of us knows how much time we've been given. So are we gonna live it in fear and rage or shame? Or are we gonna live full out? I'm gonna live full out as much time as I've been given. I don't know how much time that is. You're preaching to the choir. Oh yes, totally. <laughs> we, we are simpatico, we are from the same tribe. Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got to live, vi live vivaciously. This, we have the most wonderful gift and that's your life. My life is the most wonderful gift. Now, what are we going to do with it? That's the thing. That's the thing, <laughs> right? I love it. I love it. I love great <laughs> stuff, Janet. Now tell us about your new foundation, Planetary Peace, Power and Prosperity Legacy Foundation. Uh, you know, actually, I, before, I want, I want, and especially answer these two questions about the, about the foundation. Does this really offer a semantic solution to all the human created suffering on a planet and a way to bring peace, power, and prosperity into every life? Now have at it. <laughs> if people are open, open to learning and listening and just 
playing with, experimenting with some of the tools and the practices. Legally, planetary peace, power, and prosperity was the Articles of Incorporation were filed in the state of Florida on April 17th, 2020. So we're a very new 501c3 educational foundation, but I am working with, oh my gosh, some of the most amazing healers, uh, Reiki masters, shamans, educators, people who have been challenged with she shame or fear or anger, and they can help other people release those emotions and shift into purpose and passion and power and discovering who they really are, that authentic self within that authentic, unique self. It's fascinating to me because we're in the process right now of acquiring a tract of land, a retreat center in the near Asheville, North Carolina. And as we're doing this, we're starting to organize and structure all these amazing healers who are, have been coming together now for um, a year and a half, I guess. Some of them I've known much longer than that. But we're all coming together as kind of a creative, co-creative and manifesting team in gratitude and mutual support. Our intention is to co-create a model, peaceful, powerful, prosperous community. But it's also becoming almost, these are elders, most of them. They, they're people who hold a lot of wisdom and they can support those who are younger and have had less experience and are struggling in discovering who they are, that authentic, unique being within. It's fascinating to me to watch this evolve and it doesn't feel like something that I'm controlling at all or organizing. It's certainly not a top-down patriarchal structure. It's a It's an energetic connection. The whole Asheville piece started coming together when I sat down at a table of strangers this past August in Flat Rock where I own a little cottage. I, I, you know, there's, I, I was looking for a friend. This is an outdoor barbecue in the evening. I was looking for a friend, he was not there. And I don't know anybody else in the whole place. So there's this table with eight, eight seats at it. Seven of them are occupied. And I asked if I could join this group of strangers. As we began talking, I started talking about the foundation. And I discovered the gentleman next to me was a full professor at the University of Florida who referred me to a, a connection of his, a boyhood friend, who was very had a lot of connections with Buddhism but he thought this friend could refer me to a piece of land that he was familiar with, which he did. That's not the piece of land we're looking at right now. But the old friend whom I was looking for at that barbecue, we reconnected through the connections that the other people had made uh, for me at that table of strangers. And he was the one who pointed us to this piece of land that already, it's 40 acres of ground. 30 acres are pure forest. And the remaining 10 acres have a retreat center already built there, which has three circles of magnificent spaces to be used either for gathering circle work, uh, which is a practice. It's a wonderful way of bringing people together in a very bonded space with each person speaking his or her own truth, but being listened to by everyone else. There's not all this chaos going on. So the, so the foundation is going to have retreats and, and events over at on this location? 
and and you know whether it happens on this location or whether it happens virtually or whether it happens in some other way that I cannot yet even foresee or anticipate. We are coming together in this. It feels like an amazing energy vortex. It's not something I am orchestrating from the top down from my little human left brain, which is very limited. It's something that is evolving through all of us, uh, as we come together and start listening to one another and respecting one another and being kind to our, both ourselves and the other people, the other living beings around us. It's a whole different energy or dynamic, which I, I'm, my words are very poor reflections of the actual experience of being friends. It's a wonderful thing you're doing. If we can respect and listen to each other, boy, uh, boy, this what a different place this will be. I mean, truly, all of us, because we all have our agenda and our intentions, but if we can listen and respect the other, boy, what a different place this will be. So fantastic, kudos. And, and let me say, I've already been to Janet's website, planetarypeacepowerandprosperity.org. I loved it. And I've already told her, that and she's gonna she's gonna give she's gonna extend a, an invitation and and then i will i'll tell you how i feel about it uh after she does that so janet uh don't do you have an invitation for everyone yeah i do um we are partnering with other unique human beings on this planet and or other 501c3 foundations nonprofit foundations we are partnering to amplify the good work that everyone is doing on this planet. So if you go onto the website, Planetary Peace Power, A-N-D, prosperity, the, the words do matter, uh, the way you spell them matters, Planetary Peace Power, A-N-D, prosperity.org, and you scroll to the bottom, you will see a carousel going around there at the bottom with the names, with logos and websites and a short descriptor, description in words of what that particular organization is focused on, whether it's bringing clean water to people on the planet who don't have clean water, whether it's bringing food to impoverished children, whether it's educating women who have not been permitted to be educated before, whatever the work is, whether it's just pure creativity and co-creativity. We are, if, if anyone has see something that really interests them and they wanna go deeper into it, they just click on that link and it takes them to the other persons or the other entities website and they can go explore in more depth. And then, you know, if people are willing then also to put our website and our logo on their sites in whatever way they want to do it as partners or as supporters or whatever. Well, I, can, I can tell the listeners and the viewers, I've already checked it out and I'm going to do it. I mean, it's not, it's not limited to 501Cs, right? Great. No. Uh, it's so anybody I'm, who is doing good work on the planet. I'm going to do it. I love what it's about. You know, if we come together and align and positivity and respect, then <laughs> why wouldn't we so i'm definitely going to do this and we'll and so th there's here's your first yes right here from from the this <laughs> now this you're podcast. you're about the 10th or 15th well, from this okay. podcast i mean from this podcast okay, okay. Oh, all I'm, right. I'm the first yes you're gonna get from this podcast i'm so i'm signing up it's wonderful awesome stuff you do and uh I, and we're gonna now i'm gonna ask you for your final remarks but i will say that janet has like six websites and a whole bunch of social media, all of them will be listed on her page at selfhelpcoaching.com. So we don't, you don't have to get into them, all of them. Uh, definitely, we can promote planetary peace, power, and prosperity.org or whatever else you want to. But I will have them all listed for any viewer or listener. They're all going to be listed on the page. And it's great stuff and for you to check out. I mean, almost oh, awesome stuff. But I want to ask Janet, Janet now uh, for her final remarks uh, at the end of this interview. Well, you know, there are no final remarks, <laughs> 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 It is, 
<laughs> it is a continuing conversation. Let me just mention, though, that we are working on putting together a membership site uh, where people, if, if they choose to, you know, if they're interested in paying a small monthly fee, they can have access to almost unlimited content that will support them in uncovering that unique, authentic person that each and every one of them is. They, they become support systems or fingers pointing at the moon or new ways of thinking and being in this world. Fantastic. I love it. And how do people contact you? We already mentioned the website, planetarypeacepowerandprosperity.org. There's a bunch of others that will be listed on the page. But how do people contact you? That's probably the best way to contact me. And I even forget what the email address is there. But I know there is a contact button. Okay. And I think there's a form you can fill out. And part of that, I, I don't like to give out my personal information to, do the, to the entire world simply because in this physical body, I have physical limitations. There's only so much I can deal with at one time, and I want to deal with it well. It's important to me to keep each conversation in integrity. Very so good. You, you know, there's only so much you can do well, with the, in a the person, physical body. A person can go to your website, or you can they can go to the page and see all the great list of, of websites and social media that you have, and I'm sure they can contact you that way. Jan, you have been a, truly a unique and special guest. I haven't had any guest on like you. I love what you, I love your body of experience and it's just fantastic. It's so varied and eclectic and what you're, especially what you're doing now. Uh, I'm signing up. I'm getting involved. You're awesome. Great stuff. I really appreciate your time and what you're doing. And uh, I thank you very much. And I want everyone to remember that every one of us is responsible for ourselves and we can all use some help. <laughs> Lots of help. <laughs> that, that's my mantra. That's my slogan. So if there's any way to, to subscribe or like or share this, please do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tony. I mean, it's been a pleasure to be on your show. Thank Lots you, of Jack. fun. Thank you for tuning in to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. Remember to visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Self-Help Coaching Podcast.